Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome online for this new JEC webinar. My name is Benjamin Debusser. I'm the head of events program for JEC. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today's webinar is Next Generation Composite Solutions with Visiomer Special Team Thaculates. The webinar is organized with Evonik. It will introduce selected Visiomer Special Team Thaculates, which are less hazardous and with low volatile organic compound for styrene replacement in vinyl ester and unsaturated polyester resins. Additionally, Insight beyond biobased will be given to introduce these metacrylates, footprint, and endprint. This information enables the composite resin producer to assess the sustainable impact of the reactive diluents. In line with the mission creating possibilities for a sustainable world, Evonik offers the composite industry Visiomer specialty metacrylates to first replace styrene as reactive diluent, second, substitute petrochemical with bio-based solution, and last but not least, of course, reduce the weight of composite parts even more. For those who don't know, Evonik is a leader in specialty chemistry. Its specialty methacrylate product line stands for high quality products, global service, and outstanding expertise. To present this great innovation, I'm pleased to welcome today Dr. Sabine Komelt, Manager of Applied Technology at Evonik Operations. So Sabine works as Lab Manager in the Applied Technology for the product line specialty methacrylates of Evonik. She has over 10 years of experience in the field of methacrylic monomers, then poly their polymerization behavior, and their performance in various applications. Sabine received her PhD in polymer chemistry from the University of Mainz prior to joining Evonik in 2010. Sabine is joined by Elizabeth Klamer, manager new business development at Evonik Operations. Elizabeth has started to work for Evonik as a chemical engineer in 1997. 87, sorry. <laughs> she held different positions in applied technology, technical service, technical marketing, and new business development. Since 2016, she works as new business development manager within the product line specialty methacrylates of Evonik. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to remind our audience that you can ask all the questions you have in the question tab that you will find at the bottom right of your screen. So please feel free to start asking questions from the beginning as the questions come to your mind. And we will make sure to answer all the questions that have been asked at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. As usual, you can also upvote the, the questions from other participants. During the webinar, we will also post polls to answer and to better understand the goals of our audience. So thanks in advance for your participation in these polls. And the first one will be published in a minute. Uh, to maximize your experience of the webinar, I recommend to be connected through cable wire rather than Wi-Fi. And in any case, the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view the entire program online later on gccomposites.tv. That's all for now. So let's now discover the next generation composite solutions with Visiomer specialty methacrylates. Sabine, Elizabeth, welcome online. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today. The stage is now yours. Yeah, thank you, Benjamin, for introducing us to our audience. Hello, composite audience. You already know who uh, Sabine and me are. Um, I'm Elisabeth Klamer. Now we would like to get to know you a little better. To understand how to tweak our presentation for you, we would like to entertain you. And at the same time, we would like um, to uh, you to take some valuable uh, thing away from our presentation today. So uh, here is the poll already. Um, so um, do you know methacrylates uh, used as a reactive diluents in composite resins? Um, the first asked answer would be yes. Methacrylates are contained in our resins. Um, answer B or answer two is I'm not sure. 
And answer three is no, I have never heard of methacrylates. So please vote now. I know where to vote. So we have already. I have I have submitted my vote. Please <laughs> <laughs> follow me. So we have already uh, more than 50 votes uh, and some of them coming in, uh, still coming in. Uh, for uh, almost 60% of the audience, uh, yes, they know methacrylates use at, as reactive diluents in composite resins. 30% uh, are not sure uh, and only a bit <laughs> less than 10%, sorry, uh, never heard of them. So yeah, okay. 60, 30, and 10%. Yeah, I think we can live with that result. Thank you for answering and for letting us get to know you a little better. So more than 60% know methacolates well and use them. That's good news. And uh, a little uh, less than 40% um, is not sure or has never heard of methacolates. That's a something we are going to change now. So, but before we start with methacrylates, um, we have two slides about where Sabine and me belong within Evonik, one of the world's leading specialty chemicals company. The Visumer specialty methacrylates business is part of Evonik's operative division specialty additives. With our Visumere specialty methacrylates, we hold the tools to create possibilities for a sustainable world. With our Visumere specialty methacrylates, we are active not only in composite application, but in a huge variety of different market industries and application. For example, in the coatings industry, for emulsion in waterborne coatings, in the adhesive industry for structural adhesive, then the composite industry for, for vinyl ester and unsaturated polyester resin, for chemical anchoring in the construction industry, uh, different plastics, textile, tile and leather um, applications, water and um, paper applications, personal care, synthesis, biodiesel, oil and gas application and uh, refinery, refinery processing. Okay, let's move to today's agenda. Visumere um, next generation composite solutions for our joint sustainability journey. We have chosen sustainability as a leading topic for today's agenda. It is fit to the sustainability strategy of Evonik and Evonik, on the other hand, has based its sustainability strategy on the 17 sustainability development goals of the United Nations. You might have already recognized the colored icons of the six different sustainability development goals um, of the UN uh, we will cover today in our presentation. We want to take you on our joint sustainability journey with uh, Visumere Next Generation Visumere Solutions. Goal is to reduce our negative impact we have on with our business, the so-called footprint, and to increase the positive contribution we can achieve with our product, the so-called handprint. First, we will introduce less hazardous reactive diluents to you to ensure health and safety. By implementing these less hazardous reactive diluents from the Visumere specialty methacrylate portfolio into your composite products, you can increase this handprint. Second, you and us together can reduce the carbon footprint and find climate change by using well-selected raw material, uh, such as bio-based Visumere Terra products, for example. And third, another way to fight climate change is to reduce the weight of the composite part. For example, less energy is needed to transport and to run wind power stations with lighter weight wind turbines. 
to to offer less hazardous reactive diluents to our customers uh, applies to the sustainability goal, ensure health and safety. Let's step back one moment. What are reactive diluents and where are they used in the, in the composite industry? To produce fiber reinforced plastics, fiber are soaked in resins and cured. Resins are thermoset resins such as unsaturated polyester resins and vinyl ester. Unsaturated in the UPR indicates that there are free double bounds uh, waiting for the radical polymerization. And vinyl ester resins also have double bounds for radical polymerization at the end of the backbone. They are better accessible for methylates than the ones in the UPR backbone. Now we will investigate reactive diluents. Reactive diluents have two different functions in composite resins. Uh, the first one is they uh, lower the viscosity of the polymer resin to enable different application technologies. Hand spray application needs a different viscosity from sheet molding compounds. The second function is to react to a crosslinker, uh, is to react the crosslinker to form a polymer network. So after acting uh, as a viscosity reducer, the reactive diluent stays in the composite resin and co-polymerizes with the resin by adding a curing system. The standard established reactive diluent used in UPR and vinyl ester resins is styrene. So why change a running system? Styrene is well established as a reactive diluent in composite resin. It has a good dissolving power for the resins. So it takes its function as a viscosity reducer of the polymer resin seriously. Um, styrene has good, a good reactivity, a good ability to co-polymerize with the composite resin and a nice price. But styrene has some health issues. It comes with three labels, hazardous labels and three uh, and four health sentences which need to be considered. The closer people work with styrene containing composite resins, the more they are endangered. Every region and country has its own strategy to protect the people who work with the composite resins. Uh, for example, limits for styrene at the workplace. But uh, the bottom line is the aim to replace styrene. Visionmare specialty methacolates can serve as styrene replacement, but not without challenges. Um, vinyl ester's chemical structure allow for a complete styrene replacement. As you remember, the double bonds needed for the radical polymerization with the reactive diluents are easy accessible at the end of the polymeric backbone. <coughs> Sorry. Zero styrene vinyl ester composite resins are well known to the composite industry. Um, unsaturated polyesters chemical structure allows only for partial uh, styrene replacement. The chemical incompatibility issue of the methacolates can be overcome by having some styrene left in the reactive diluents mixture. Low styrene UPR are available in the composite industry. Additional measures can be taken to reduce the styrene emission from the composite resin further, for example, um, robot application. Replacing styrene in composite resin is not an easy one-to-one -one replacement task. Um, it's a mixture of different monomers that does the trick. And sometimes the mixture might even contain a combination of cross-linkers and monofunctional co-monomers. As the dissolving power of styrene alternatives is weaker than the dissolving power of styrene, 
the content of the reactive diluent mixture in the composite resin might need to be adjusted. We now want to show you all available cross-linkers you can use in your reactive diluent mixture for composite resins. The six cross-linkers can be used in the reactive diluent mix mixture for composite resins. Cross-linkers have two functional groups with a double bond on each end of the cross-linker needed for the radical polymerization. They can build a polymeric network when co-polymerized with the composite resin uh, unsaturated polyester or vinyl ester. The three top ones we consider as hydrophilic and the chain between the two functional groups become longer from EGDMA to TRGDMA to PEC200 DMA. The other three cross-linkers are hydrophobic. The longer the chain between the two functional groups gets, the more hydroph hydrophobic the cross-linker is. Another consequence of having a long chain between the two functional groups is that the monomer become less hazardous and lose their label, as you can see in PEC200 DMA and 16 HD DMA. PEC200 DMA is even considered as a polymer. The vapor pressure of all Visumer specialty methylates crosslinkers are far lower than the one for styrene. This results in a lower order and reduced VOC, volatile organic compounds. The top two cross-linkers used in um, unsaturated polyester and vinyl ester resins in the composite industries are PEC200 DMA and 1,4 BDDMA. They are used for applications in wind energy, marine, cured in place pipes and transportation. One for BDDMA is label friendly, decreases the water uptake of the composite parts because of its hydrophobic nature, adds mechanical strength and a good heat deflection temperature to the composite resin. PEC200 DMA is a cross linker to select if you need more flexible resins and label free. We looked at our Visumer Crosslinker portfolio and especially at the two top ones and have found two new crosslinker structures that fit exactly between the PEC200 DMA and the 1,4 BD DMA from their property profile. The DPG DMA and the TPG DMA have two or three uh, propylene glycol groups in the chain between the two functional groups. Less hydrophilic than the ethylene glycol group in the PEC200 DMA and at the same time less hydrophobic than the butane group in the 1,4 BDDMA. This is a good addition uh, to the crosslinker portfolio for composite resins. More possible crosslinkers you can choose from. I have a, a quick question on, on this slide, Elizabeth. Uh, okay. Can you let us know if, if these new cross-linkers are already available? Um, these cross-linkers are uh, developmental monomers, so uh, samples of these cross-linkers are available. And as soon as we see enough market demand, we start um, the registration process to um, reach and to launch the product. Okay, thank you. Um, where was I? Okay. Yeah, when searching for the right mixture of co-monomers to replace styrene, uh, you can also add monofunctional Visumer specialty methylates. They help to control the cross-linking density and add to the heat deflection temperature on, of the composite resin. Um, the choice of monofunctional methacolates for reactive diluent mixture consists of compact cyclic structures. 
the aromatic BNMA works well and can be topped by CHMA in the glass transition temperature if, uh, if this is important. And the highest glass transition temperature is provided uh, by uh, Visumia Terra Iboma with a TG of 150 degrees Celsius. All alkyl and aryl structures are label friendly with uh, only an exclamation mark and they have lower vapor pressure than styrene. As for the odor, uh, individual tastes differ from person to person. So some people prefer the odor of styrene to the smell of iboma, which is uh, the caffeine smell. And caffeine is also a key word for the next topic of, on our agenda. So lower carbon footprint, for example, by using bio-based raw material. And with that, I would like to hand over to Sabine Kermelt now. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, that's true. I will take over the second part, our second topic regarding fighting the climate change and especially on lowering the carbon footprint, which is, I think, a topic which is related to all uh, topics in society today. And I will show you how we uh, assess our carbon footprint of our products and also which of our products can help you to reduce the carbon footprint in your formulations. So, but first of all, I also want to learn a little bit more about you, uh, the audience. We have another poll. Uh, the question is, how important is sustainability for your company? The answer possibilities are sustainability is crucial for meeting our own sustainability goals. The second answer is it is crucial to meet market expectations. The third option would be it's a nice add-on but not essential at the moment. And the fourth, uh, fourth one would be, it's not important at the moment for my company. So please answer. I also have to choose something. All right. All right, we have already a bit more, almost 60 votes right now. Um, for uh, 47, 46 percent, sorry, it's uh, crucial for meeting our own sustainability goal. Mm -hmm. Then for 28 percent, it's crucial to meet market expectation. Then for 23 percent, it's a nice add-on, but not essential at the moment. And only for 2 percent, uh, it's not important. All right. Thanks, Benjamin. Uh, yeah, the distribution kind of reflects what I learned from our customers. So there are, yeah, most companies are working on sustainability. They gave their own sustainability, they have their own sustainability goals. And if they are not having them, it at least they are working on that topic due to the market, or they're at least starting to think how the sustainability is is um, kind of affecting their businesses. So thank you for your, the insights on, on your background. And as it, Elizabeth already told, uh, Ivonic has its own sustainability goals. And um, for our methacrylates, uh, the topic is important because we can have an impact on the carbon footprint of our products. Today, you see here schematic Mainly the methacrylate monomers are based on petrochemical resources. So that's the standard. But we have the options to introduce um, uh, raw materials, bio-based raw materials, uh, by using different specialty functionalizations, by using different alcohols. And this introduction would increase the biocarbon content of monomers and it would decrease the carbon footprint. As you see as well, the methacrylate unit is still petrochemical based. Unfortunately, today, uh, the MMA is not readily available on a bio-based version. But we already have partially bio-based monomers in our portfolio, and I will give you an overview on the next slide. 
Our bio-based methagrolates are sold under the trade name Visiomet Terra. Um, the Terra versions are not only bio-based, they are also low in hazard. So you will not find a Visiomet Terra that has a CMR label. That's important to notice as well. Today, we have three commercial products, um, the Visiomet Terra C13 MA, C17.4, and the so-called Iboma you see on the left-hand side. They have a biocarbon content of up to 81% and are established products on the market. But we are striving to expand that portfolio and soon to expand that portfolio. And therefore, we have two options. We have the so-called ready-to-make bio-based solutions. These are basically bio-based equivalents of already existing commercial products. So for example, our Crosslinker PEC-200 dimethacrylate, which Elizabeth already introduced as one of the reactive diluents used in composite resins. Um, the second option are new developments. These are new structures, new methacrylates based on readily available bio-based feedstocks. And these new developments, at the moment, we are focusing on four structures. Um, one is a so-called oxidative crosslinker, uh, one is a rigid crosslinker, and two alkyl methacrylates. And um, they are under development. And if you are interested in more details on those structures, let us know. We disclose these informations under NDA. For all our Terra products, we also, because that's one of the most important things, look at their carbon footprint. And we access the carbon footprint by the so-called LCA analysis. That's the life cycle assessment. And on the next slide, I will show you how our life cycle assessment um, is working. So we are um, using a life cycle assessment according to the ISO 14040. Um, and the life cycle assessment is basically a compilation of and, and evaluation of all the inputs that go into a product and the outputs of a pro process, and most important, their potential impacts on, on our environment. What is important is that you have to define your system boundaries and actually what you define as life cycle. In our case, we always look at the so-called gradle to gate analysis. This means we look at our production, but we also include our raw materials. So the materials and the production. If we would uh, look at a wider view, um, so for the whole life of a product, from the start point till the end of life or its disposal, then you would call it a cradle to grave analysis. In the case of materials that are recycled, like for example, PET bottles, you could even use an analysis that is looking at the cradle to grave analysis. But today, um, all the information that I show you or that we provide to our customers is the so-called cradle to gate assessment. And this assessment leads to the um, yeah, different impact categories. So um, the inputs and outputs that are used to calculate the impact on the environment of your product um, can be categorized by their uh, environmental effects. And for example, there are, you see a lot of categories one would be the biotic depletion potential, which is looking at the permanent depletion of any resources, fossil or antimental resources of your product um, in its life cycle. But today, as I pointed out on the slide, most important is the so-called global warming potential, which is also called the carbon footprint. And um, this is the value you of uh, CO2 equivalents that your product produces in, in uh, its life cycle that you look at. 
So these values um, are um, available for our Terra versions. Um, and um, um, on the next slide, we will go further into the details on that. The Terra versions, um, besides the LCA analysis, also um, are certified uh, by the C14 method. The C14 method measures the bio C carbon, uh, biocarbon content, sorry. And um, the certificate is also uh, available for all our customers as well as the LCA assessments. And I have a quick question, Sabine, regarding uh, LCA, which is uh, nowadays really important uh, for mm -hmm. the industry. Uh, do you have the LCA data uh, available for all of your products? Uh, no, unfortunately not today. Uh, so we have started to assess all our Terra products, including the development products. Um, we also um, have available for certain uh, of our, um, yeah, large volume products, the LCA data. So if uh, anybody is interested also in additional products, um, please contact us. Um, and we are uh, constantly kind of continuing to evaluate the whole portfolio. Okay, thank you. All right, um, but let's go back to our development products. Um, so I mentioned that we are uh, extending our portfolio and um, how important the carbon footprint is. And I want to show you a comparison of um, our uh, standard crosslinkers, the petrochemical based ones and their bio-based equivalents. So we um, analyzed the global warming potential um, here shown for three different crosslinkers of our petrochemical versions and the potential Terra versions. On the left-hand side, you see the one, the PEC 200 DMA, and we can, by using a bio-based um, raw materials, reduce the carbon footprint by 21%. The same range can be achieved, for example, uh, for 1,4-BD DMA, which is also an important cross-linker here. Um, but if we look at a short-chain cross-linker, like shown um, on the right-hand um, columns, the EGDMA, it only has basically two biocarbons in it. Then we see that the global warming potential is basically not really reduced, although it has a biocarbon content of 20%, which sounds in the first place quite a number. So you have to always to consider the higher the biocarbon content is, um, usually um, a higher biocom content results in a higher reduction of the GVP. A lower biocom content has a smaller impact and therefore questions also the overall sustainability of this approach. Um, we decided in the first place to go with the Visiomere PEC 200 DMA as one of our uh, new products to extend our portfolio. And um, to give you a little glimpse on its performance. No, the slide is not changing. Oh, there it is. Um, you can see here a comparison of the petrochemical version and the Terra version. It is a poly time measurement, so a polymerization time measurement, and you basically see no difference. So the quality of the bio-based version and the standard version is the same. And um, finally, uh, look at even a further scope. Bio-based materials that we just discussed, they are important. Um, but during our assessment, we learned, as you saw for the EGDMA, that not all bio-based raw materials will lead to a sustainable solution. And that's why we also looked at solutions beyond bio-based. And in our case for the methacrylates, 
uh, we have different options. If we look at the bio-based raw materials, uh, they raise important questions. So we don't only look at the global warming potential as we did in the few slides, but we also have to answer questions like land use change. All materials that are growing need land. We also have to answer, are the materials in competition with food? Um, it would be idle if they are waste products of the food production. And of course, renewable materials um, are different in supply. We have to look at the quality of consistent quality uh, do you, that you expect as our customers from us and also on the availability. So bio-based does not always mean sustainable. And therefore, we looked which options we have for our methacrylates to provide additional sustainable solutions. And here is one option. One option is to use circular materials. And that would be, in our case, to use circular MMA, so methyl methacrylate. In the scheme you see, the part that was in the other cases uh, still petrochemical based is now based on a recycled material and that reduces the carbon footprint. In addition, if we think a step further, then we could even combine our first approach by using bio-based raw materials with circular materials. And that would be kind of the top approach to increase to decrease the carbon footprint of our materials. But how much would the carbon footprint decrease of one of our materials? We did an example calculation for our product 1,4-BDDMA. And the results are here. We can reduce the carbon footprint by using bio-based materials by around 20% using bio-butandiol. But if we use recycled MMA, so circular MMA, the impact is much larger. So we already have a reduction of 42%. And the combination of those two options results in a reduction of 60%. And that's really a, a significant reduction if you think um, um, in terms of GBP. So in future, it could be possible. Unfortunately, not today, not yet because the availability of the needed raw materials in that case are not given for a large scale production. But this was kind of a glimpse into the future. And um, at the end of the carbon footprint reduction topic, I would like to invite you because I think it is very important that to create truly sustainable solutions, the whole value chain has to work together. So we as your supplier, our supplier, you as our customers, we have to work together on processes, on the application, on sustainable application to increase the handprint, for example, of the products that we develop. And that's, I think, something that uh, is going to change the industry dramatically in the next couple of years. Our third part today is also on fighting the climate change, and that's on the part of handprint. So how can we use our products to increase the handprint? And in our case, I want to show you an example for lightweight design. We have a product in our portfolio, which is called Visiomere Hema P. Visiomere Hema P is um, quite special because it carries a phosphate group, a phosphate functionality, as you see here in the structure. This monomer is actually not new. It has been known in the adhesive industry for quite a while as an adhesion promoter to polar substrates. We use this monomer now as um, resin strength promoter in class fiber composites. 
to increase the adhesion of the matrix to the glass fibers. And our test results showed that um, the performance increased the in all mechanical tests. So we did ILSS, we did tensile testing and compression testing. And the addition of HEMA-P as a co-reactive diluent improves all those mechanical properties. I will show you the details on the next slides. But first of all, a short reminder, the measurement of the interlaminar shear strength, short ILSS, is an indication for an improved fiber to matrix adhesion. It is basically a three-point bending test and shows uh, the resistance of the composite of the laminate against delamination. Um, a higher LSS, I, I'm sorry, ILSS um, is um, showing you or is prolonging the fatigue life of a laminate and um, the addition of our HEMA-P can increase the ILSS. So to get into the numbers, we use the HEMA-P as co-reactive diluent in two different systems, in a standard UPR resin and in the standard vinyl Easter resin. And in both cases, we see an increase. Um, the increase in the vinyl Easter is about 19%, and for the unsaturated polyester resin, it's 36%. We also did uh, tensile testing on those laminates, and here as well, we see an increase for both resin systems um, in the resin, fa resin failure. So we have an increase for the unsaturated polyester resin of about 31% and for the vinyl ester resin about 45%. If you think about the improvement of the mechanical properties, you can also think about reducing weight. So producing the same that the same composites with same mechanical properties, but with reduced weight by using HEMA-P as a resin strength promoter. And the reduced weight is important for many applications. For example, just two of them, wind energy or marine applications, where you usually have high impacts, you need good mechanical strength, and you need good durability. So that's all from my side. I hand over to Elizabeth. Okay, thank you, Zavina. I, go, I co hope you can hear me again. Okay, <laughs> so on our joint sustainability journey, we showed you how to use less hazardous reactive diluents for your composite resins how to avoid styrene to ensure health and safety, a positive contribution you can achieve with your product, the so-called handprint. Lower carbon footprint to fight climate change can be obtained by implementing more sustainable raw material, bio-based and beyond with the Visimer Terra brand fighting climate change by enabling lighter weight composite parts can be accomplished with the resin strength promoter Visumer Hema P in glass fiber composites. These are our next generation composite solutions for you. And if we were to ask you again, Paul number one, do you know methacolates used as reactive diluents in composite resins? We suppose your answer would be yes for everyone now. Thank you very much for attending our sustainability journey and thank you for the to the Jack Composite Group for the excellent organization of this webinar and for the opportunity to talk to so many composite people. We would love to talk to you in person uh, at the Jack World in Paris, so uh, please pass by. And if you are not able to join the Composite Fair, please reach out to us directly to discuss composites further. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Sabine, for this great presentation. So it's now time to move to the Q&A part, and we already have received uh, some questions from the audience. So thank you very much. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to post them in the question tab on the bottom right of your screen. So let's start with the first question. So from John Summerscales, who has uh, three questions in his questions. So let's start with the first one. What, what proportion of the metacrylate uh, is bio-based? Sabine, you are on mute. You are on mute, Sabine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, Beck. I think, John, you already uh, posed the question before I started uh, the second part. So we can have a bio-based content of up to 85%. It differs on the methacrylate that you're looking at. Um, and um, yeah, we have a, a different ranges. His second question is, how much processing is required to make the monomer from the source material? OK, so actually, from our side, there's uh, not more processing steps needed now yeah, because we just uh, use the raw material uh, or we are searching for bio-based raw materials that uh, are equivalent to the ones that we either use or that are new on the market. Uh, so in our case, no more process steps established um, from the um, uh, raw material side. Um, I guess it differs how the extraction process is, for example, or which raw material is used, but uh, I cannot go into detail on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and his last question, but you already uh, answered it in, the, in your presentation, but maybe you want to add a uh, few more words. Uh, is there a life cycle assessment to demonstrate en environmental cred credentials? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we, as I said, we have the um, uh, LCAs available for the Terra product range. Um, so to compare, to get an idea on uh, on the carbon footprint, for example, and um, this is uh, how you can kind of access uh, the, the raw materials that you use uh, and see how, how their uh, impact is. Thank you, Sabine. A second mm -hmm. question from Mathieu Bayet, who is asking, generally in UPR or VER, organic peroxides, uh, such as ketone peroxides, are used to cure the resins. In terms of reactivity, is there any difference between your Visiomer product and Styren in standard th thermosetting resins? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, actually, there is. So uh, all the uh, standard curing options are optimized over the last yeah, couple of years for curing UPR or vinyl ester uh, resins uh, with styrene. Um, in some cases, it's only a minor adjustment. Um, but in some cases, also the use of a different type of peroxide of MEKP version is, is necessary. So they might be an adjustment if you want to reach the same curing time. But in general, you can use the same uh, the, the, the same components, uh, but you need uh, to uh, look at the polymerization behavior in your specific resin. So it differs from resin to resin. Thank you. Let's move to the next question from Mitesh Patel. Uh, we're saying uh, if we can say bio-based material, then it should be biodegradable by the time? No. Bio-based and biodegradable are two separate yeah. things. Yeah. So biodegradation uh, <laughs> is actually, if you look at methacrylate polymers, very hard. So if you have a cured uh, yeah, methacrylate or methacrylate polymer, it is not easily biodegradable. Uh, Bio-based only means that the resources that are used come from nature or our biocarbons are added. So biodegradation and biocarbon, uh, bio-based is totally different. 
And it's also important for us that it's not biodegradable because our customer use um, our monomers, for example, for um, adhesives. And if the adhesive uh, only lasts one day because it's uh, degrading, um, then uh, you have a problem. So you want to have um, um, a better handprint in longer lasting uh, products made by our monomers. Mm -hmm. It could come important for other applications uh, where we, for example, surfactants, which encounter the environment, come into water. Um, but here, in terms of composites, it's uh, rather not the case. Thank you to you both. We have another question from John Summerscales. Um, we're saying you've discussed substitution of styrene in UP or uh, V resins. Do you have a grade appropriate for in situ polymerization uh, during monomer infusion under flexible tooling? Um, I have to uh, read the question again, sorry. <laughs> so you, you discussed substitution of styrene yeah. in UP yeah. V resin. Do you have a grade appropriate for in situ polymerization during monomer infusion under flexible tooling? That's very specific. Yeah. Maybe uh, John can uh, come to our booth and discuss okay. this with uh, with us, and then we are a little more prepared for this detailed <laughs> <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. So John, that's a reason to, to come to Jack World. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the meaning of recycled MMA? How do you recycle MMA? Because usually this is a part of a mixture with UP mm -hmm. and builds a composite after curing. Yeah, so um, recycled MMA, in this case, the source would be PMMA, so uh, polymethyl methacrylate, which is used um, in, uh, in plastic or as, as uh, yeah. Um, and this is kind of a pure, and there you can go by depolymerization. Um, so there are um, uh, several kind of, uh, yeah, um, uh, opportunities uh, to uh, or kind of uh, ways to do it uh, but uh, in that case it would not be recycling from an UPR composite or from a vinyl ester based one so this is really um, a, a, the raw the, the uh, yeah, resource would be PMMA from the for the recycled MMA <laughs> Another question from Lars Goran Robrek. Uh, as far as I know, 1.6 HDDMA is labeled with an exclamation mark and is not la label free. Do you have other information? We have to check that. Thank you for the input. <laughs> Okay, and we have another question from Paco Martin, who is asking, what is the performance of Visiomer uh, Grandes in reducing viscosity in UP and VER compared to styrene? Okay, so uh, in general, the dilution power or the solvent power of methacrylate is less good than styrene. So this is also one, one advantage that Elizabeth mentioned. Styrene has, for those resins, a very good dissolving power. Methacrylates do not have this dissolving power. So um, you have different options. You, um, first of all, can use monomethacrylates because they usually uh, help a little bit to reduce the, uh, the, um, the um, viscosity as well. But in general, we have to say that the dissolving power is less than with styrene. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We just received another question from Alex Lubnin. What are the changes, the chances, sorry, for bio-based monomers to cause the same as oil derived? <laughs> I, uh, I hope, I hope in ten years I could say uh, they cost the same, but not today. So um, there are um, 
if you look at the equivalents, they are more costly uh, today than the petrochemical versions. Great. Uh, I have also a few questions that I would like to ask you. Um, do you also have uh, equilates in your portfolio? Um, we only have one um, acrylate in our portfolio, which is the Iboa, uh, but we are specialized on methacolates. All right, thanks. Uh, are the new Terra products uh, already commercially available? So the new ones, the ready to um, ready to make ones, uh, we are in the process of uh, commercializing the PEC Terra a uh, PEC 200 Terra version. Um, the other ones, as I said, are development pro products. And if you're more interested in that, uh, let us know. We are, are we are able to sample those products for testing, uh, but at the moment they are still, um, yeah, um, all the information are disclosed under NDA. Okay, we received another question from Deepa Roy. Uh, with asking, are these suitable for use as matrix in composites? If not, if not, why? Mm. Uh, are these suitable? So I guess he means the Terra products. Uh, if you are, so I can answer in different ways. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth <laughs> uh, showed you the ones that are uh, suitable, suitable? <laughs> suitable for using as reactive diluents in different matrix systems. For the Terra versions, um, the um, existing ones um, are not, uh, so the C13 and C17.4 are only, can be used in a minor way because they are very hydrophobic. So they usually don't are compatible with most of the resin type systems. The Iboma can be used to uh, increase the uh, TG. In our new developments, we have an additional crosslinker, which could possibly be used um, as a reactive diluent, and also the methacrylates that we are developing. But that um, needs to be tested as well. And we have the Terra PEC 200 DMA that yeah. is perfectly, perfectly suitable for composite matrix. Yeah, that's and true. the Terra brand. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we got this uh, question yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, he also asked why. So mostly it, it depends on the compatibility of the methacrylates with the resin. So if they're really offering the opportunity to dissolve the resin and to lower the viscosity. I mean, that's the the purpose of the reactive diluent. And um, if the methacrylate does not fit to the resin, then that doesn't work. And a very last question. Uh, did you also test the resin strength promotion with carbon fibers? Yes, uh, we, we actually did. Unfortunately, uh, we did not see the same increases that we see for the class fibers. But um, as I told you, the HEMA-P is very good, a very good adhesion promoter for polar substrates. So if you think of the class fibers as a yeah, polar substrate, it makes sense to use HEMA-P. For the carbon fibers, uh, we did a try, but unfortunately, uh, until today, we did not receive the same increases as for the uh, class fibers. Thank you very much. So the web, yeah, sorry, Elisabeth. Yeah, um, the, there was a similar question now in, in the uh, question uh, area and also the question if we have um, results regarding different um, amounts of HEMA-P. Uh, yes, we have uh, more results uh, you can find on our uh, website or uh, we can send you the results if you are interested in, in them. We have uh, done a, a lot more than we have um, uh, showed to you today. And um, yeah, we, we can send it to you or you can find it on the Visumir website. Thank you, Elizabeth, for flagging this uh, very last question we just received. Um, so the webinar comes to the end now. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thanks for all your questions. 
you have Evonik uh, and Sabine and Elizabeth contact details on screen. So please don't hesitate to reach out to them. Would you like to pursue the discussion and, and have more information about uh, uh, the Visiomer specialty methaculates? We hope that you enjoy the time with us uh, today and have discovered a great technology, a great innovation. I also want to thank Evonik, of course, and all people involved in this webinar uh, today. So thank you, uh, Sabine and Elizabeth, and thank you also to Eva for uh, organizing this webinar with uh, Jack. The webinar was recorded and the link will be sent to you uh, right now together with a link to download the presentation. And in a few days, it will be available on uh, Jack Web TV at uh, jccomposites.tv, where you can uh, access to all previous webinar and video content and conferences of uh, Jack events. If you attend Jack World uh, 2023 next month, I hope so, uh, Evonik will be exhibiting in all five J4E, so don't miss, don't miss the chance to pass by their booth and, and meet with the team. And we all look forward to welcoming you uh, next month in Paris uh, and uh, reunite uh, the composite community in, in one place. So thanks again very much and, and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>